All right, thanks Dr. Todd. Good morning everyone and thanks for tuning in to Pediatric Grand Rounds this morning. Today's speaker is Louisville's very own Dr. Patricia Todd. Dr. Todd earned her Bachelor of Arts from Bellarmine University and completed her medical training at the University of Louisville in 2012. She found a passion for treating dermatologic conditions in children during her dermatology residency at Loyola in Chicago, Illinois where after she pursued a fellowship in pediatric dermatology at Boston Children's Hospital. She returned to her hometown with the goal of establishing a full-fledged pediatric dermatology clinic, which at the time did not exist in the city or state. But after practicing with a mix of adults and children for three years, she did join the University of Louisville's Department of Pediatrics and Norton Children's to provide full pediatric derm care for our community's kids. She's active within the Pediatric Dermatology Society and is passionate about improving racial disparities in healthcare. Dr. Todd treats all types of skin disorders, but is particular, particularly interested in infantile hemangiomas, eczema, and inflammatory skin disorders, including psoriasis and auto, autoimmune disease. So without further ado, we'll hand things over to Dr. Todd and thanks so much for being here this morning. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> nice to, well, virtually see everyone. Um, like they said, I did join the Department of Pediatrics about a year ago, and I've gotten the pleasure to get to know um, several of the other faculty and residents and um, hope to continue to collaborate more um, on and provide better and expanded uh, dermatologic care for our pediatric patients. So there's a lot of um, great topics within pediatric dermatology to discuss, um, but I decided on vascular anomalies uh, because these tend to, particularly the ones we're going to talk about today, are pretty common, and I felt that it hopefully would um, have some relevance to a number of different specialties um, and particularly uh, general pediatric care. Um, so. Uh, we will go ahead and get started. Um, I do not have any relevant disclosures, though some of the um, topics that we will discuss do include treatments that are considered off-label, um, but will be supported by literature. Um, and so <clears throat> for today, we will start off with uh, some background on research in vascular anomalies, um, particularly focusing on infantile hemangiomas and capillary malformations. Um, I will discuss some new research uh, regarding therapy for infantile hemangiomas, and then we will touch on distribution of both infantile and capillary mal malformations and when that um, is significant um, and to take note of. Um, and then finally, we'll um, discuss a little bit of the genetics of capillary malformations that have come out over the last um, five to 10 years. So vascular anomalies research within modern medicine really um, was pioneered by John Mulliken and Anthony Young, who are actually plastic and vascular surgeons, which reflects just how interdisciplinary this field is. Um, and this was in the 1970s. And so um, they started working on it um, within their own practices. And this paper came out in 1982, where there was actually a, the, it was first presented to give some sort of um, logical or uh, science-based, not science-based, pathologic-based um, uh, categorization for vascular anomalies. And Julie Glowacki was a, um, was a pathologist. And so they basically looked at both clinical findings of common vascular anomalies in children, um, and then took samples of them and looked at their histopathologic behavior. And they categorized them into tumors and malformations. And tumors were based on clinical growth, having a proliferative phase, um, but also histologically showing hypercellularity and increased cell turnover. And then the other lesions were categorized as malformations if they seem to be fairly uh, stable throughout life, um, or at least childhood. Um, and when they biopsied and looked at these vessels, there wasn't hypercellularity there, but the vessels were atypical. There was some, um, the morphologic features of them were abnormal. And so we've lived with this um, uh, categorization into tumors or malformations 
then, and we do continue to use those um, right now, but there is some suggestion that potentially these are not the, uh, should not be set in stone. Um, because we do know that vascular malformations seen here as a, these are venous malformations, they can expand over time, suggesting that there is proliferation. And we also know that vascular malformations respond to antiproliferative agents. So this is an example of serolimus working on a um, lymphatic malformation. So um, it is an um, ever evolving landscape and there continues to be research by a number of entities. Um, and so a new thought um, is that potentially categorizing these based on their genetic um, uh, underpinnings is a better way to more accurately um, label them and understand them uh, in terms of their pathophysiology potential for um, you know, change over time and um, considerations for management. And that was um, discussed this past spring by Beth Drillet, who's a pediatric dermatologist at the University of Wisconsin, does a ton of research on vascular anomalies. And um, uh, so she gave a really great talk about uh, kind of changing the paradigm as to how we look at vascular anomalies. Um, I do want to though, you know, refer to this table here. This is the International Society for the Study of Vascular Anomalies. They're kind of the main world group that um, looks at vascular anomalies. And while we still have their classification is still based on those vascular malformations and tumorous designations, um, it is a really helpful document. And you can just Google this. This is, um, the, you don't have to be a member to access this, but it's really nice and it helps, you know, these classifications and have are, t are um, reviewed every other year at a conference and updated. And so if you really want to give an accurate name to something that you're evaluating, um, this is a great reference for you to, to use. Um, there are a number of groups that are looking at <clears throat> vascular anomalies, um, uh, including ISVA, right, which is a multidisciplinary. There's surgeons and pathologists and hematologist, oncologist, um, dermatologist, radiologist, um, uh, all within that within that group. Um, it, within the United States and Canada, there's the Hemangioma Investigator Group, which is, um, uh, there's a lot of pediatric dermatologists uh, in that, within that group. There's also uh, the Birthmarks Focus Study Group within the PEDRA, uh, which is the Research Alliance of Pediatric Dermatology. And then there's a number of U.S. and international vascular anomaly centers, which do, you know, on the ground work of, you know, assessing and managing these patients and being able to um, really translate what we're, you know, learning um, in our research fields into the clinical practice. Nomenclature, I want to make a quick note on nomenclature with vascular anomalies. This is, um, it's a challenging part of managing vascular anomalies because there are, um, po possibly because there are a lot of different specialties who approach these and everybody kind of has their own um, way of addressing them. Uh, but there's a lot of variability in, in what things are called, what terms are used, and um, sometimes it's, it's just incorrect. Um, and sometimes there's actually you know, accurate, multiple accurate terms for the same thing. Um, and so I think that is one of the goals of these groups. Um, they're doing research is to, uh, to try and label things to where we all agree on the same terms so that when we're discussing or presenting or publishing about these, that everybody recognizes what we're talking about. Um, so for example, one of the things that I commonly get referred to as me is something that comes in for a hemangioma. Well, first of all, the term hemangioma is not, that's, that's not a clinical diagnosis. That's a, just a term. It's, it, um, and it doesn't refer to any one particular thing. But I think oftentimes when people say hemangioma, they mean infantile hemangioma. And, but they sometimes will refer to these other entities as those. And so, um, so obviously on the top left, we have a capillary hemangioma. Next to that, there's a spider angioma. Down in the uh, blue-eyed baby, she's got a pyogenic granuloma. Um, then um, there's an angiokeratoma on the leg <clears throat> of this patient down on the bottom right. And then that's a congenital hemangioma on the bottom left. So all of those things sometimes are referred to as hemangiomas, and yet it's 
they're very different. They have very different etiologies. They have very different prognoses. And so in recognizing that we really want to use infantile hemangioma for the specific lesion that we'll discuss in a little bit. Additionally, like I mentioned, oftentimes there are multiple appropriate terms for the same lesion. So port wine stain and nevus, nevus lamius can both be applied to these solid vascular patches within the realm of capillary malformations. <clears throat> um, port wine stain tends to be more commonly um, applied. Uh, and then over here on the right, these kind of fading capillary malformations, the ones that we see very commonly in, in babies on the um, either glabella, forehead, medial eyelids, can be also referred to as a salmon patch, a neva simplex, or like I mentioned, a fading capillary malformation. Um, and so re recognizing that now we have, you know, four terms for generally the same process, even though certainly outcomes are different with these two types of capillary malformations, it can get, it can get confusing. There's just a lot of terms out there. Um, I, going back to hemangiomas, infantile hemangiomas, really that's the term that we should use. Um, these are, I still see frequently referred to as capillary hemangiomas, um, which is really, it's similar capillary hemangiomas, kind of like saying hemangioma, right? I mean, when you look at a bunch of anything that has the word kind of hemangioma on it is going to be made up of generally capillary structures. Um, so that doesn't, you know, the, the clinical behavior of an infantile hemangioma is very different than other, like a congenital hemangioma, um, or if you were to call something, it just an angioma, like a spider angioma or a cherry angioma. So really try and focus on using infantile hemangioma. Additionally, strawberry hemangioma is helpful when you see these kind of strawberry color of the superficial lesions, but some infantile hemangiomas are deep and they don't even have a superficial component and those are blue. Um, and so that term strawberry hemangioma can be confusing. Uh, so we will delve into some newer research um, within these two entities, the infantile hemangioma and the capillary malformation. So we'll start with um, research related to infantile hemangiomas. Um, and as a quick review, these are um, the most common tumor of infancy. Um, the epidemiology is probably not fully known, um, partly because of like what I just mentioned, that things were miscategorized as infantile hemangiomas. Um, but at least one population-based study um, within the past 10 years suggested more, it's closer to 2%. Um, and so, but, but very common in babies. They appear in the first four weeks of life. Very, very important to recognize that these are not present. Um, they rapidly grow in the first eight weeks. So that's the most important growth period. But 80% of that growth is done by four months of age. Um, and so while they can continue to slowly get a little bit larger up to about a year of, of age, you know, most of what they're gonna look like is at that, you know, when they're around four, four months is, you know, we're really out of that rapid proliferation. And then the involution phase, which is the final phase, is very slow and it takes three to five years. Um, and so it's important to recognize and counsel parents that, you know, it's gonna grow a lot faster than it fades. OK, and while, you know, this is a common, a common idea of what an infantile hemangioma looks like, it's a nice, you know, strawberry color, superficial, um, you know, not particularly huge. Um, there are a number of infantile hemangiomas that are not so simple. And um, so up here we have a segmental infantile hemangioma on the face and scalp, much more likely to ulcerate when they're segmental like this. Um, she's, you know, this patient will um, likely have a significant change in um, density of hair uh, over this kind of large area. If it came, came a little bit closer to her eye, potentially could have some um, effect on, you know, uh, the, the, you know, might push a little bit on the eye. I mean, you know, has risk for associations because it's large segmental on the face and scalp. We'll go into that in a bit. We've got an ulcerated hemangioma down here. Ulcerations are painful at risk of infection and absolutely will leave a scar. Um, and then up here, we've got a pretty large infantile hemangioma on the cheek that actually is keeping her mouth open. She's having trouble shutting her mouth because it's so heavy. And so um, potentially affecting her ability to feed normally. And even though, you know, these clearly seem to, to need treatment, it is important to recognize again that 
while previous, I think, thoughts or, or the, you know, the general counseling was that these will go away, more than 50% of these lesions are going to leave some sort of permanent cutaneous sequelae. And so recognizing if this lesion is likely to leave something there, is that also going to be a factor in this patient's life going forward? So because of these various potential complications, we have treatment for infantile hemangiomas. And the standard of care is right now beta blockers. Um, now, the only FDA-approved treatment or beta blocker for management of infantile hemangiomas is propranolol. And it's most efficacious when started during that rapid proliferative phase, which we discussed was the first eight weeks of life. Um, somewhere around 98% of patients will respond to an extent. So it's a pretty effective treatment. And over three-fourths of um, those patients will get at least 75% improvement um, when treated at the recommended doses of two to three mg per kg per day. Um, there's a lot of uh, thought as to over the years, once so propranol got approved in 2014, um, and so the, you know, the major papers came out around then. And so there was thoughts, you know, it was really kind of an incidental finding. Um, there were babies who were on propranolol for cardiac anomalies that they were born with, and they noticed that the infantile hemangiomas never grew. Um, and so it was an incidental finding. Um, so subsequently, we found that it's efficacious, and it's generally safe, got the FDA indication, and now there's this you know, study into, well, why does it work? Um, and so there's a lot of theories um, that, you know, we know that it has some, some vasoconstriction immediately when you start to use it, you'll start to see some dulling of that color within the first few days. Um, so potentially it has to do with blood flow to the, to the lesion. Does, does propranolol have some effect on, you know, the progenitor cells for these um, endothelial cells? So maybe we're not letting them, you know, we're, we're slowing that down or are we affecting growth factors, right, that promote endothelial growth, um, you know, uh, more kind of based on, you know, what is, what are the cues? Why do these happen in general? You know, what's turning them on? What's, what's altered? And so does propranolol kind of turn off those signals that are promoting growth? Um, so these are just a couple of new studies. There's a lot of work into how propranolol works. Um, but one of the things that we've, we've has been shown actually in a number of studies is that focusing on that growth factor effect um, and finding that levels of vascular endothelial growth factor um, are diminished when patients are on propranolol. And so this was um, a study out of actually the hemonc literature that basically showed that in proliferating untreated infantile hemangiomas, we've got VEGFA at you know this level of 275 picograms per milliliter. Then when you put them on propranolol after three months, this actually significantly decreases. Um, so we know that it's having an effect on VEGF, okay? Now, interestingly, though, the levels never get down to the, the, the levels of VEGF just naturally in involuting infantile hemangiomas. And yet we know that propranolol can, can induce some involution. So is this the whole picture? Additionally, this dropping of the VEGFA didn't specifically have a correlation with the change in the size of the lesion. So does this even mean anything? Another paper that's a little bit more <laughs> basic science, um, I had to do some reviewing of, of lab work um, when I was reading this paper, but um, again demonstrated with our table on the left that propranolol, as concentrations increase, um, we see diminishing levels of VEGFA, okay? Um, and, but what they were more looking into is what, what is the cause of that? How do we decrease that, that VEGFA? Or is there another mechanism that's um, changing, that's changing the proliferative um, uh, uh, mechanism? And so they were looking at microRNA, particularly microRNA 424, which is a tumor suppressor. Um, and so when you have high levels of microRNA 424, when it's active, it actually, you know, suppresses those proteins that are going to activate the cell cycle to, to proliferate. So you really want high levels of MIR424. Well, in infantile hemangiomas, we find that those levels are low. And so, again, potentially looking at to the pathogenesis of infantile hemangiomas. Um, so when they actually looked at adding propranolol to these cells, 
their levels of MI or microRNA 424 go up, which is good. Um, as propranolol comes out of the system, as it um, you know diminishes in its activity, those levels um, go back down. Um, and the they found in in cell cultures that the um, the cells were less proliferative, less invasive, and so you know potentially this also has a role in the function. One of the other more clinically oriented um, areas of research within infantile hemangiomas is looking at alternatives to propranolol. So propranolol works very well, but we're always looking for bigger and, or for, for better and safer um, options. Propranolol does have some risk associated with it. Um, it is a, it's a non-selective beta adrenergic recepting blocking agent, um, meaning that it, it has um, receptors in organs that we don't need it to have receptors in for its effect on hemangiomas, infantile hemangiomas. Um, and so particularly in kids who have pulmonary disease, it may be contraindicated. Um, we know it, it can cross the blood-brain barrier. One of the most common side effects that, um, for me, oftentimes is the reason why parents want to come off propranolol is, is the uh, disrupted sleep, which is a, you know, bit of a quagmire in, in, of its own because we really don't know that it's the propranolol causing that, but we know that it crosses the blood-brain barrier, so it's a potential reason. And down the line, we don't completely understand whether or not there are downstream effects of being on something that gets into the blood, into the brain for a full year during infancy. Um, talking about developmental and other um, neurocognitive deficits potentially related to these, to use of propranolol. And then we know that, you know, being a non-selective beta-adrenergic receptor blocking agent, potentially it has more of that um, risk of hypoglycemia that gets more severe before it's detected. Um, compared to other beta blockers. Um, so again, just to reinforce that propranolol is the only FDA indicated treatment for infantile hemangioma, but in children who have a severe side effect or who um, are, have a contraindication to using it, there are two other main beta blockers that have been studied. So back in 2015, um, so natalol, I should step back and say that these are the, m most of the research on natalol is out of Canada and in July, which I'll touch on the study that was presented in July, um, one of the, the pediatric dermatologists who presented it basically said that in, that in Canada, they all use nanolol. That's kind of their first line um, agent that they utilize for infantile hemangiomas. So back in 2015, they did a smaller study looking at um, basically to see for hemangiomas that didn't respond to propranolol or had adverse effects, um, to look at uh, natalol use. And they basically found that it worked really well. Um, over six months of therapy, um, they, they showed that imitol mangiomas improved by an average of 87%. Um, and if you started it before three months of age, that they actually improved by 94%. So pretty close to almost going away um, if you started it very early. Um, the side effect profile was pretty similar to what's typical for propranolol therapy. Um, most common was sleep disturbance, um, gastrointestinal symptoms, um, and then asymmetric, or, sorry, asymptomatic lowering of um, heart rate and blood pressure. And this was the study that she presented um, in at the Society for Pediatric Dermatology annual meeting this summer, basically was a larger um, randomized controlled double-blinded non-inferiority trial um, to, you know, better strengthen um, uh, uh, support for use of nanolol. And they actually compared it to propranolol and, and did very much demonstrated that the improvement that you saw, and this is again over six months um, with a standard dosing of two milligrams per kilogram per day, so nanolol the same, is the same dosing as propranolol showed that it was non-inferior and actually that it probably appeared superior to um, propranolol therapy when, when utilized um, with the same protocol. Um, additionally, we'll mention adverse effects were again similar <laughs> and sleep disturbance was unchanged um, despite the thought that natalol um, 
what you know doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier as much, and so that that effect didn't seem to be as important, uh, or didn't seem to be as significant. But but noting that natalol may be a superior treatment. The other one that that studies have looked at is atenolol, um, and this. Um, Atenolol has the potential benefit as being a cardioselective blocker, right? So potentially has a, a improved safety profile. This could be indicated for children who have that underlying pulmonary disease. Again, it also is li less lipophilic than propranolol, so less um, blood-brain barrier, um, less ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. So again, just potential uh, decreased side effects. Um, and so in 2017, this was a study from pediatric dermatologists, and they this was technically a non-inferiority study, um, but was retrospective, and uh, compared um, propranolol and atenolol. And it, you know, and it, this is an interesting, you know, approach to a study when you're doing a non-inferiority study. So we're looking for changes to not be significant, um, significantly different, and and did find that basically the hemangioma activity score, which is a combination of size and appearance, color, and that those changes for patients both with similar regimens of atenolol and propranolol, they were not significantly different. Um, notably, there was 4% there was of adverse effects in the atenolol group compared to 13% of adverse effects in the propranolol group, but it was not statistically significant. So then there was a much more robust study um, out of China looking at, uh, this was actually in our ear, nose, and throat um, literature, um, and basically also looking at um, comparing the two. Um, it was um, non, it was the clinicians and patients were not blinded, but the assessors who looked at photographs to determine improvement in size and color, et cetera, they were blinded to treatment. And um, so they um, basically found, again, that uh, improvement was not significant. Uh, it's not significantly different between atenolol and propranolol. Um, but that adverse events were. So atenolol had significantly fewer adverse events compared to propranolol. Um, the other interesting part about atenolol and potentially natalol is that they have longer half-lives than propranolol and so may be applicable for decreased dosing, which can be beneficial in an infant um, that has to be on a medication. That's just highlighting those adverse effects. Okay, we'll um, change directions just a bit and we'll talk about insights into um, distribution. So infantile hemangiomas, um, you can have focal or segmental. Um, and so focal are these kind of isolated lesions. They come up, they're usually round, somewhat oval shaped, but they don't really cover, uh, they don't seem to have any particular um, geographic uh, appear or distribution. Uh, segmental are infantile hemangiomas that cover a region. Um, and oftentimes these are based on, um, once we look at segmental patterns and the importance of looking at segmental patterns is to kind of identify why does it cover this pattern? What is the embryological um, pathway? What tissues are moving this direction when, when a baby is born? Uh, or is developing and to kind of get a better understanding of, again, pathogenesis for these lesions. Um, so we've got focal and segmental hemangiomas, and I'll just mention that a lot of birthmarks, including infantile hemangiomas and capillary malformations, um, these segmental birthmarks um, represent mosaicism. And mosaicism is a is a talk in into itself, um, but it's a really you know, it's a really interesting um, phenomenon um, that correlates, you know, genetics with um, clinical features. And so, again, just touching on the point that when you recognize a pattern, um, it can give you an idea um, potentially about genetic um, etiology, timing of, of potentially where this mutation um, where inciting event occurred, and what are the what are the tissues that are affected, and which can help you recognize what other tissues you know where should I be looking when I see a segmental lesion? Where else might this have happened? That's not on the skin. So, um, infantile segmental infantile hemangiomas are can be anywhere on the body. 
commonly on the face and scalp, but also can occur on the extremities. And um, this year, basically recently, it's published online before um, print, um, they basically, this group, um, Anita Hegstrom is actually at IU, and she's been studying infantile GMS her whole career and pres you know, presented a paper um, or published a paper previously several years ago on the mapping of the segments of the face. And this was just to, this was a more robust study to, you know, better delineate these, um, these segments and also include the scalp. And so they found that when you see a segmental infantile hemangioma on the head and neck, it usually falls into one of these categories. Um, and so what we'll find too is that there's a similar pattern for capillary malformations. Um, but we've got, you know, a frontal, a forehead, lateral forehead, upper eyelid segment, um, a maxillary segment, a mandibular segment, the central forehead, nose, um, central facial segment, and then the scalp is commonly a C shape behind the ear. And what's interesting about these segments is that um, they follow um, the composition of facial placodes, um, which are oftentimes, or which have a very, um, they follow neural crest um, controlled development of the face. Um, and the, you know, the main difference is that that um, superior facial placode is uh, segmented um, between the lateral forehead and the central forehead when we see infantile hemangiomas um, instead of being one complete um, segment. Um, so examples of, of how you might see these. So S1, right, um, upper forehead, upper eyelid. S2, which is our maxillary segment. S3, which is your um, mandibular lip and notably preauricular cheek um, is, is included in the S3 segment and the lower half of the ear. Um, S4, which is that uh, frontal uh, and glabellar nasal, and um, the you know then the scalp which is behind the ear, and notably what they also found is to recognize that if you have an infantile hemangioma that doesn't necessarily completely fill in that whole segment, but it seems to be you know filling in part of the segment. Consider that a partial segmental, um, so it doesn't look focal, but it does it it doesn't fill in right the whole distribution. These partial segmental infantile hemangiomas may carry some of the risks of full segmental infantile hemangiomas. So don't count those out when you see them. This was another study um, that came out this year that looked at, okay, so let's look at those segments and can we find any risk factors based on where they're distributed for facey syndrome, which is the main association with segmental infantile hemangiomas on the, on the scalp and face. So facey syndrome is our posterior fossa mal, um, uh, anomalies, hemangiomas, arterial anomalies, which are in the brain or neck, um, commonly in the circle of Willis, you'll have um, dysplastic vessels, spiraling vessels, or even complete loss of a vessel, um, increasing right risk of, of stroke in these patients. Um, cardiac anomalies, and these are typically structural and commonly affect the um, vessels that leave the, the, the heart, right? So looking at the aorta and, and the branches off of the aorta eye anomalies, and sternal clefting or super umbilical rafi. So basically syndrome is a constellation of anatomic anomalies that are typically, there are some that like a sternal cleft, which can be seen at birth, but most of these are not going to be noticeable until you see that segmental hemangioma. So is there any way to stratify where these are located um, and your risk for that? You know, really, they weren't. We didn't find a specific in this study. They didn't really find a specific um, segment that was drastically more likely to have it. Um, but they did find that you know, area greater than 25 centimeters squared, which is what we have used before, basically seeing five a lesion that's at least five centimeters, and this is you know five centimeters in both directions is very important. Um, having greater than three locations involved, so multiple segments involved, that is something that you should certainly, we're going to see a significant increase. You see there, like that odds ratio is almost 18. Um, 
those were, you know, clinical characteristics that are going to um, increase your risk. Notice, I also want to point out here that actually other, being other than white, um, and particularly Hispanic, significantly increased your risk. Um, and it's, it's interesting that, you know, we see, as far as what we know with epidemiologic data, Caucasia, Caucasians are more likely to have infantile hemangiomas that are, you know, just in general. Um, so when you see um, uh, infantile hemangiomas in patients who are not white, you know, potentially a little bit more worrisome for having um, an internal anomaly. Um, they did find that S2 involvement or parotid infantile hemangiomas, so parotid is kind of a tricky location, right? It's kind of the preauricular cheek, which falls into that S3, but it really looks like your S2 infantile hemangiomas. They're kind of round. Um, they don't follow that mandibular tract. Um, S uh, parotid tend to be deeper as well and less likely to have a superficial component. So those were protective. So those are more less likely to be involved, but don't 100% rule out the risk of having underlying feces. Um, I will quickly touch on um, neuroaxial. This was, um, again, just a, you're trying to bring in data from kind of multidisciplinary um, journals. So this was in a, a, a radiology journal. Interestingly, kind of touching on that facies syndrome, when you see an infantile hemangioma that's segmental on the um, face or scalp, um, they may have a high risk of having a lesion intracranial. And so um, these patients, now notably all these patients also had facies syndrome. Um, but the, what I found interesting is that the most common location in these internal intracranial hemangiomas was in the aud internal auditory canal, and that uh, about a fifth of those patients had some effect on hearing. Not all of it was permanent because hemangiomas, regardless of where they're located in the body, will follow the same process. They go through a proliferative phase and then a involution phase, so oftentimes they'll go away on their own, um, but, but important to, to recognize the importance of imaging um, when you're worried, when you have something that could, uh, that's segmental on the face and scalp. And then again, this also noted that um, in these patients with faces, 67, uh, the majority of them, well, I, I guess the posterior fossil anomalies was just under half of them, but um, the majority of them had some other structural anomaly within the brain, and almost all of them had some sort of um, cardiovascular structural anomaly, particularly in this one study. I don't think that we see 95% with um, se severe cardiovascular structural anomalies. It's, it's hard to say. Some of those might have had like a, a uncomplicated, just a common structural anomaly in the heart that would have resolved on its own. But, but again, the importance of imaging for these patients who have these segmental um, hemangiomas on the face and neck. Um, this is a bit of an aside unrelated to segmental hemangiomas. I just want to reinforce that when you do see an infantile hemangioma with greater than five, um, or, you, or you have a patient with greater than five infantile hemangiomas, um, they, you know, our, our study, our data before that said to check the liver for lesions was back from 2011, but they did, um, someone did do a much larger study um, this year and basically, um, again, came, came to the same conclusion that five is the cutoff level for checking for infantile hemangioma. So it's still recommended. Um, and then just to review that liver ultrasound is with Doppler is the first screening test to go with. If you have any confusing findings, follow that up with a liver MRI. Um, and if you recognize that there are infantile hemangiomas within the liver, you want to repeat those studies at two week intervals. And once you have stabilization of lesions, right, they'll measure them on those studies. Once you have a stabilized size, you can extend Expand it by extend it by two more weeks. So then you'll go to four weeks, and if they stabilize at four weeks, you go to six weeks. Um, and again, that these lesions will also follow um, the same course as the um, cutaneous infantile hemangiomas. All right, we'll we'll change um, over to capillary malformations. Um, again, to go over some basics, uh, these are present at birth. Um, these it can have a number of different appearances and uh, can happen anywhere on the body. And so um, 
30 to 40 percent of patients will of newborns will have some form of a capillary malformation. Usually it's these benign faint lesions that are commonly located on the central forehead, occipital scalp or medial upper eyelids. The ones on the face tend to resolve over time uh, over the first three to five years of life. Um, the lesion on the occipital scalp or sometimes on the vertex of the scalp, those can persist um, but are uncomplicated. Um, but you can also have more significant capillary malformations. And these are much less common, more like 0.3% of babies will get these. Um, and oftentimes some, the way to distinguish these is that they're much, much more robust in color. Um, they're very solid and again, typically cover a segmental region. Um, and so um, some important ones or some, some patterns that we commonly see are the um, upper face and forehead or even any portion on the face. You can have the lower face as well. Um, you can have it segmental on the leg and arm, leg or arm, or you might have diffuse um, various segments over various body parts. Um, but when you see those solid red geometric patches, um, those are ones to really pay attention to. Those are probably going to have, um, they certainly have a higher risk of something else uh, anomalous occurring. Um, maybe not life-threatening, but more likely to have overgrowth of the tissue in the same distribution, um, potentially be more cosmetically um, disconcerting for the patient over time. And then there's kind of this intermediate largely diffuse seg seg er, di in a diffuse uh, pattern. Sorry, when I say diffuse, I, I think about the whole body, but you know, overlying a larger anatomical site, so it can be segmental, um, but are, are lighter in color, more reticulated in appearance, um, usually seen on an extremity. And those are, you know, it's, it's, they're kind of in the middle. They, they may have some, some association, but they also could just be a, a mild capillary malformation that's, that's on the on the skin without really any associations. And so again, these are, are ones that we're not too worried about. They tend to be a little bit fainter in these characteristic locations. This is kind of that intermediate. You see they're, they're very subtle. Um, you know, they're not those solid patches, but could have some changes with them. And in, in the, the lesion on the patient, uh, the older patient, you can see a little bit of a, a girth uh, discrepancy in her leg. Um, then you have these solid lesions, which make you a little bit more worried in certain scenarios. And these are ones that are more likely over time to thicken um, and to potentially have overgrowth of the underlying subcutaneous or bone tissue. Um, and so, you know, present more, if not, an, you know, a life-threatening or, you know, symptomatic internal anomaly to have more of a, a, a problematic issues from the surface. And then these um, locations or demons, you know, uh, distributions are certainly worrisome. Um, diffuse geographic patches, solid patches on the body, or this, you know, we know this upper facial forehead um, distribution um, is, is, a, is a high risk location for a solid um, patch. So there are a couple of different syndromes that can be associated with segmental capillary malformations. And um, some of the literature that um, has been done over the last five years is looking at, again, distribution. When do we get worried about it? Similar with those segmental infantile hemangiomas on the face and scalp. And so in 2014, we had a group, um, Wilkie and all, uh, that looked at that basically these were this was a group that said this is not or capillary malformations do not follow our trigeminal nerve distributions they're not dermatomal um, it's more important that they're on the forehead and basically in that study unless if they had no forehead involved they found that none of those patients had any signs of sturge weber so forehead involvement was really important so in 2015 they mapped they had a they had a group that mapped facial segmental capillary malformations and looked at the different patterns. And again, they did look for which ones were more associated with Sturge Weber, but also just again, to look at the distribution, what does this suggest about the pathogenesis of these lesions? And so they did reinforce that basically involvement of the forehead was important, but notably this two, four, and five, 
really significant forehead involvement, whether it's lateral or central, were the highest risk locations. Um, and so that's kind of what we've based it on since then. And this, this more clinically based study of, with pediatric dermatology in, in 2020, um, they try, we're trying to make it easier um, to, to, to stratify these forehead, when you're looking at the forehead, which are the ones that you wanna worry about. And they basically suggested, you know, you look at this line that goes right across the eye. So upper eyelid is included. You know, if you have that central facial or you have um, a, over 50% of a hemi forehead. So you take one half of the forehead, and if you have over 50% involvement of a capillary malformation, that, that those were significant um, risk factors for having um, findings for Sturge Weber on imaging. So a little bit more helpful for us to um, ki kind of stratify those patients and maybe reassure the patients who come in that don't have those findings, right? That they're very low risk of having Sturge Weber, which can be you know, very, um, just, you know, really um, anxiety provoking for parents. Because honestly, there's not a lot for you to do um, up front. I mean, the imaging studies that would detect um, the um, malformations in the brain are not sensitive until they're a year of age, um, unless they have symptoms like seizures. And so kind of stratifying and giving some good guidance for those for those families early on based on what their um, capillary malformation looks like is helpful. Okay, and so this is the last topic for today, genetics of capillary malformations. This is, I think, really where our field is going um, with a number of, of malformations. We're just going to talk about capillary malformations um, and is, is pretty exciting and, and just really interesting how these, these sorts of things come about. And so, um, again, these syndromes associated with capillary malformations, including Sturge Weber, can be considered a mosaic um, a, a mosaic pathology. Um, so you have something that happens and, but, but not, you know, it's not in all the tissues, right? So, um, so really we're just seeing genetic mutations, whether it's, there's a lot of different the ways that mosaics work, but when you can understand um, the pattern, it can help again, identify um, what else to, to think about with these structures um, or, or uh, when you see these types of birthmarks. Um, and so kind of the way that identification of these mutations, we found, you know, you had these, you had a bunch of patients that had a constellation of findings that had overlap, but not necessarily everybody had the same thing. And so you had this cluster of patients. And so then you kind of start looking at their genomes and you find a, a, a unifying genetic etiology in these patients. And then you, you kind of look along that pathway to see, are there other areas that could explain some other diagnoses, right? Um, that have, again, similar findings, but not that gene. Let's look at genes around that, that would affect other variants in this pathway. And most of these are going to revolve around the RAS MAP kinase pathway or the mTOR um, pathway. And so um, these two are highly conserved pathways that um, are found found in you know in our cells. Um, they're really important for um, controlling cell survival and proliferation, um, motility, and they generally respond to either extracellular uh, new, uh, environment, nutrient, oxygen um, availability, or to growth factors. Um, another cytokines that trigger them. And these are really well studied pathways because they are very important in a number of malignancies. Um, and um, so once they, in 2012, they identified PIK3CA mutation as, um, as the etiology for macrocephaly capillary malformation. Um, and then subsequently, these other what are called PIK3CA related overgrowth syndromes like cloves, and um, there's some that don't have uh, as much cutaneous. There's um, infiltrating like facial lipomatosis and some um, have a number of anomalies with overgrowth, particularly lipomatous overgrowth um, and uh, brain abnormalities. And then in 2013, they found that um, GNAC was a mutation that's pathogenic for Serge Weber, which is Sim, it's in a similar, you know, it's in, within those two pathways. Um, and then more recently, they found that GNA11 is identified in segmental uh, uh, capillary malformation on the extremities associated with overgrowth. And so 
over time, we found, you know, that within this, this is another demonstration of that pathway and how complicated it is, but how there's a lot of crosstalk. You know, we have GNAC over here mutation. That's we found that to be pathogenic for the majority of cases in um, Sturge Weber. Then we have uh, over here PIP3CA, which we see in macrocephaly capillary malformation. Um, up here, the, down right below PIK3CA, we have AKT, which we see in Proteus syndrome, which can have segmental capillary malformations. And over here, RASA1, which is seen in a, a capillary malformation syndrome called capillary malformation arterial venous malformation. And um, so I, I just think it's a it's a really interesting um, area. Um, it's, a, you know, as we learn more about the genetics, kind of <laughs> touching back to that first, um, that first kind of couple of slides where we talked about really realizing how much genetics play a role in everything. Um, we can um, we can almost we can do things when we know the genetics behind um, lesions. And so for for one, looking at reverse phenotyping. So if we know that something is a GNA11 uh, mutation, you know, compared to a GNA a GNAC mutation, there there are different clinical behaviors uh, based on which mutation causes the capillary malformation, even though they may be in a very similar distribution. And so this basically shows that, you know, much higher risk of segmental overgrowth and glaucoma with a GNAT versus a GNA11 mutation. And then also, also to, for, for therapeutics, right? If we understand the genetic underpinnings of, an, of, of, a, of a lesion, we can actually target those pathways and potentially really have life-altering improvements for, for patients who have these um, these syndromes. And so this is a specific, like, you know, doesn't even have a name, pick 3 ca um, inhibitor that was um, helping a patient with clothes. Um, okay, so just a quick review. Um, ISFA has a good reference if you need help with accurate, you know, designation of what you're seeing. Um, again, propranolol remains first line. It's the only FDA approved medication. Um, we are learning more about how it works, which can help um, understand the pathophysiology and maybe possibly find the mutation that causes infidel hemangiomas. Um, but there are alternatives to propranolol that may be safer and certainly seem to be just as effective um, for patients who do not respond or have adverse effects to propranolol. Uh, important to recognize segmental infidel hemangiomas on the face. Definitely want to image the CNS and likely to do the full facies workup. Um, and uh, segmental fore forehead location of a capillary malformation is the most important risk factor for Sturge Weber. And then finally, you know, just as a review um, of, we do have some known mutations for capillary malformations that are segmental and associated with syndromes and are um, kind of the, probably the most exciting um, new research that will continue um, within this area. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Todd. Uh, we will open up the floor for any questions.